good morning. If you're joining me, um, I want to wish you a happy fourth season, um, season, season, a happy fourth Sunday of Advent this morning. Um, I am Pastor Carrie Jaycott. I am the guest pastor at Monticello Covenant Church right now. And I just want to um, welcome you as we worship together. Um, because we are not um, meeting together in person at this moment, obviously, like I don't have the gift of guitar or singing. Um, so we're primarily uh, reading God's word together, going through scriptures. Um, I've been using the lectionary to share God's word with you over the last um, six or seven weeks that we've been meeting together online through Facebook. And I just want to encourage you to use this time to um, consider the season of Advent, to consider how we are preparing for Christmas and preparing our hearts to celebrate and acknowledge Jesus's first coming and his and his second coming, which we anticipate and eagerly await um, as followers of Christ. Um, this morning, I, I lit for you. This is a hard thing with technology and being in my living room. Um, I lit for you um, a candle to remind you today that we are in the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is the peace candle. It's um, also called the angel candle, but the peace candle. And so today, as you light a candle, um, be mindful that God desires peace for us and he gives peace to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, um, I'm going to put it next to my peace. I, we have some stocking holders on our mantle that say peace. And that is something that is um, something important to each one of us that we have peace. Um, peace is something that if you asked um, people what they would want most in this world, they would probably say, I want peace on earth. Um, we see it jokingly on car bumper stickers that will say, imagine world peace, meaning imagine world peace, but it comes out world peace because it seems like it's something that is hard to imagine and hard to ask for and hard to get. Um, this morning, I invite you to um, join me in prayer. I had also listed on Facebook the scriptures for today, but as we prepare to get into God's word, I invite you to join me in prayer this morning um, as we pray together. And I'm going to start out with a personal prayer for peace. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let's pray. Lord, I invite your peace to rule my heart. As I end this year and reflect on your many gifts you have given me, let my heart be encouraged with the truth that you are a good God. I thank you for sending your son to die for me. I thank you for the peace I have through you. May my words and actions be ones that glorify you. Amen. Um, this morning, as we come to scripture and um, thinking about peace, um, I invite you, first of all, to open up to 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 5 in the Old Testament. It's really important as we do this um, work together in Advent, as we read scripture, to remember that the, the word of God was given all throughout um, history. And so when we look back on verses like 2 Samuel, we, we see how they were eagerly looking ahead to God's promises of the Messiah to come. And that's really beautiful that we get to look back and, and read that now and understand it now um, through the lens of history. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 5. After the king was settled in his palace in the garden, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not a house, I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up and out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I moved with all of my with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And then I'm Jumping down to verse 8. 
Now then tell my servant, David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel. will plant them there so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod wielded by men, with flogging inflicted by human hands. Verse 16, in verse 15 and 16, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And it says also that Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. As we pause there, I think it's important to just take a moment and see how Jesus fulfilled all those things that Nathan the prophet told David. And it's important also to think of how in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of even Jesus' own people, he did wrong. And then he was punished. He was punished with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But God's love was never taken from him. And I think that's important um, also uh, promised to us right now when we think of God's peace. When we have God's peace, it will never be taken from us. Um, that's something I encourage people with as I work with them as a counselor, is when we have peace, and, and especially when we have the congruency of our faith and, and our, um, our body and mind all working together at one point, um, God, God has given us something that the world cannot take away, that cannot be diminished or, or changed. And it's, it's beautiful to see that um, the promise that was given says that they will have a home of their own, they will not be oppressed, and they will have rest. That is a beautiful promise. Turn in your Bible to Luke 1, 26 through 38. This is the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And Mary replied, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I invite you to just think about something. Um, and, and today also, um, when I start teaching to, with you from the sermon I've prepared, I think it's really important to think about how in Matthew and in Luke, and we're going to spend some time in Matthew, how Mary and Joseph were both given messages from God because of their situation and because of um, the the probably the fear and the um, uncertainty of what was happening to them. But the beautiful thing that happens is that, first of all, the angel says, do not be afraid. And he tells tells her what is to happen and, and what Jesus's purpose is going to be. And Mary does ask a question like, how can this be? I haven't been with a man and Joseph and I are not officially married yet. We're betrothed. Um, and he tells her and also reminds her that this this power and this um, this beautiful miracle is coming from God and it's because of God. And, and Mary just accepts the message and just says, I am your servant. I'm the Lord's servant. May 
your words may be fulfilled. And so it's really important to think about how she anchors into peace when this message is given to her in the midst of something that is um, not going to be a peaceful experience in a lot of ways um, around her and in her culture and her in her world. But because of God's encouragement to her, she has peace. And that is an important thing for us to be um, thinking about and, and aware of this morning as we come to God's word and thinking about the peace that we may be each needing in our own lives right now. In Psalm 89, um, I'm going to start with verses 2 to 3, 4 to 5, 27, and 29. And I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep you um, updated as we move along here. Psalm 89, 2 through 3. I will declare that your love stands firm forever and that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You've said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. Verse 4, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Verse 5, the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. Verse 27 and 29, and I will point him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, my covenant with him that will never fail. In verse 29, I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. And those are all messianic promises to us from the Psalms of who Jesus was going to be in the line of David, which is really significant too. We look to the lineages that are in Matthew. Um, sometimes I get to those lineage parts of the Bible and I'm like, Oof, those are a lot of names and I skip over them. But the important thing that Matthew does is, is to be showing and proving how Jesus was the fulfillment of the line of David, and he fulfilled all of God's promises that were given so long ago. Um, please turn with me last from Romans 16, 25 to 27. I apologize for my sniffy nose this morning, too. I am struggling with <clears throat> allergies as we've had this warm up and cool down and snow and, and everything. I wonder if some of you are going through the same thing right now. Romans 16, 25 to 27. The Apostle Paul completes the book of book and the letter to the Romans by saying, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the good news, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's really a beautiful thing to think that as God gives peace to us, he also brings peaceful relationships and peace between people groups that had not been peace, peaceful before. And so we see that and how the Gentiles who, you know, we are included in that branch came to know Christ. And so the church was unified um, across racial, racial lines, ethnic lines, cultural lines, family lines. In Christ, we, we have peace and we are united. And that is a really beautiful thing. Um, this morning, I uh, want to just share some thoughts I've been um, thinking about over this past week. Um, and I alluded to that I, I was also going to share some thoughts from the book of Matthew. A couple things about Jesus's name, first of all, that we see that are um, revealed to us in the in the book of Matthew. And if you want to grab your Bibles, get in here. I put my Bible down. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Um Verse 18, 118 says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not take, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, 
it's important too that Matthew notes he did not consummate the marriage, which means completed through sexual intercourse until she gave birth to a son and she gave him the name Jesus. So it's important things to just think about. And the first of all is that Jesus's name has, has several meanings. And I, I know like when we think about the other things that, that Jesus does to complete, he's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's our good shepherd. And also in Matthew, we, we hear, first of all, that his name means he will save his people from their sins. And he will also be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. Those are two important promises and, and identifying marks about who Jesus is and was going to be that was given to his parents. It's also interesting to note in Luke and in, in Matthew that in, in Matthew's account, Joseph, the, the, the interesting thing about Joseph is that the angel shows up to reassure Joseph and give him direction because he was considering divorcing her. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that later. But in, in Luke's account, Mary was visited by an angel. And so they were both given direction and they were both given reassurance and guidance on what, what God was doing, what God was up to. And I think it's important that we see um, both of those perspectives and think about um, the, also the direction of what you are going to name this child because names are important. Um, my son and I were talking about that this morning when we were um, running and we were also talking about how, how different people's names um, are given as family names or they're given because it's important to to um, the, the family or the, somebody that they liked, or I know I was named after somebody that my mom babysat for this little girl named Carrie, but they wanted to name me Kari that looked like the Scandinavian version, which has always been a confusing um, point of my life of are you Carrie or Kari? Um, in, in that culture, people were named with something about God's meaning on them. And so um, Micah, for instance, the, the prophet Micah, I remember this when I was in seminary, we had to understand and know who the minor prophets were and, and what their names meant. And I always remember Micah for a microphone of declaring who is like the Lord, because that's what Micah's name means, who is like the Lord. So names were significant. And we have Jesus, meaning he will save his people from his sins, and he is God with us. In John 14, Jesus also said, peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives to you. Do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. That's in John 14, 27 to 29. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, it says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. So you think about how Jesus' name, Emmanuel, um, means also that, that God's presence, his Emmanuel with us, gives us peace. And he is peace. He is our peace. And I want you to be encouraged that at all times and in every way, in a different way than the world gives, is how Jesus grants peace. I would say one of the biggest battles that every single one of us have in our lives against um, this time that we have in, in life and living is the biggest F word in the world that I know. And it's fear. You know, I, I, I ever say that to people, they look up and they're like, which F word are you going to say? And I think it's fear. I think fear is the worst word that we have that that battles against us um i wish you could have seen right now my my 20 year old son just looked up at me really quick when i said the worst f word that i know he was like what are you gonna say and it's fear i mean if you think about this fear cripples us fear pushes us to react to situations rather than to respond to them fear steals our joy and fear robs us of peace so you as you think about um being crippled by fear. I'm sure that there's times in your life you've been crippled by fear. I, I know a lot of you have, I think about um, this beautiful woman, Karen, that I haven't met before, who's last year has been Kurt. And I'm sure that there were some points where, where in that loss, um, as we are all dealing with um, people being sick and COVID and how all this has been for us, that there are times where we have all felt crippled by fear. I know I have felt crippled by fear several times this year where my heart has almost felt like it has dropped into my stomach. And I, um, that's how we felt when we found out my daughter had COVID in, in November. It was a, a crippling fear and of what, what is going to happen, what, what is going on. And I want to speak to that as you think about the concept of peace, though, which is the opposite of fear. <clears throat> how do you feel when you think about when you have a fearful situation and you have a peaceful situation? Where would you be if you were in a peaceful situation? And where would you be in a fearful situation? Who would you be with in a peaceful situation or a fearful situation? So when we come to the, those thoughts and those situations that we all can think about and people and, and what our body's feeling and our mind is thinking, 
I think then it goes to Jesus. How in John 14, he said, my peace I give to you is different than the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Trust in God and trust also in me. And those are those beautiful promises that Jesus reminder in the world, you will have trouble. He says that, yes, you will have trouble. It's not going to be easy. Buckle up. It's going to be a ride. And the hard realities of living life is the guarantee of trouble. It's not if, it's when you will have trouble. Jesus also reminded his disciples to discover and take hold of the peace he already offered to them. He said, take heart, peace I leave with you. And I really think it's important that we differentiate between the peace that the world offers or the peace that the world talks about and Jesus's peace. I thought about this, how Jesus's peace is not made of temporal things or imperfect things. Human peace comes from an imperfect place with good and noble intentions. Don't get me wrong on that. But it comes from imperfect, sinful humans. And our ability to make and keep peace is contingent on our own resolve, our own intentions, and our own limitations. So if you consider the strivings for peace in our world... Um, some examples of that, of, you know, we think about like um, governments, um, how people groups, you know, think about these people groups in our world that have so much trouble getting together. Um, consider about families where there's um, something happening within a family and there's been a break and there's no peace and people don't get together. People don't talk for years and years and years. Those are different examples and I'm sure you have some too. So you think about the heavenly peace from the Lord God is different than, than the world. In the heavenly peace of God, there's a lack of trouble. There's shalom. That's, that's when people would say to a greeting. I, I was reading about this in, in one of the commentaries I was looking at that. Uh, and a greeting that people would say to ancient cultures, they would say shalom. It would be peace be with you. And they would say it back and, and peace be with you too, which now in our, in our culture, we might say hi and goodbye. Um, but they would, they would grant peace and they would wish that towards each other. That shalom is, is I want the best for you. I want your well-being right now. I want you to have peace and a, um, a place where there is a lack of trouble and a lack of difficulty. Peace from God is a state of trusting and being trusted. It's a state of goodwill. Think about how the angels came, came um, to the shepherds and said, um, peace on earth and, and goodwill to those on whom God's favor rests. So as you think about peace right now and, and the things that you want most in this life right now, I think all of us are struggling with a lack of peace because of what's happening in our world. We've had, you know, we've had a pandemic, which none of us have ever experienced in our lives. We've had social and racial unrest. We, we have um, so many things happening in our congregations and in our um, communities that are um, making us feel a complete lack of, of peace. And I want to I want to address that. Where are you feeling or experiencing a lack of peace currently? Oftentimes, as a therapist, when I am with people, a common stressor that clients are experiencing is anxiety. And a goal, which we'll begin with, obviously, the long term goal will be how do we decrease your anxiety? With objectives, we'll be um, identifying the root causes of the anxiety um, or historic causes or where anxiety has been present. And then introducing coping skills and ways of managing anxiety, which is really what happens when we have a lack of peace in our life. These are all helpful, I believe, in treating the lack of peace and anxiety that um, it's known for. But I also understand that our relationship with God to be the other part, as people of faith can have, and that's allowing God access to our stories, our hearts, our minds, and our emotions. In our scripture reading today in Matthew that I shared with you, the story of Mary and Joseph, um, I'm sure that they experienced an incredible amount of anxiety. Um, this was an anxiety producing experience. You think about the cultural norms that they were um, being confronted with, with Mary's pregnancy. First of all, Mary and Joseph, they were betrothed, which was like, uh, it was actually a legal form of marriage, but it was not a complete form of marriage because Mary had not been taken yet into Joseph's home. The thing I didn't know um, was that in this culture, when you were betrothed, it also meant that if your fiance died, you were also considered a widow. So it was a legal and binding um, relationship that was seen as marriage, but it was not just completed in, this, in the act of sexual intercourse and the joining of, of two people into one flesh. And so the, the fact of Mary being pregnant um, had implications for her and Joseph. Um, Joseph, it says he was considering divorce. He was considering how also not to publicly shame her. 
um, how to how to help her in this situation because it says he was a righteous man. So it it seems here he was praying on this, he was considering it, he was thinking about it, and also what to do about this because obviously people also would think that he was the father and that he was divorcing her and shaming her, which would have been just as bad as well. Um, you think about how Matthew shares the details of the angels coming to him, to Joseph and Mary, and they both find themselves in situations that are less than peaceful. Um, you think about how God knew what they were both thinking. I'm sure God knew. I know God knew that Joseph was, was worried. He was concerned. He didn't know what to do, but he wanted to do the right thing. And for Mary, she was very vulnerable and probably scared. But we have God's peace being given to both of these young people. His message through angelic messengers brought clarity and peace. And the beautiful part of the story is that it allowed that peace allowed them to have peaceful obedience and surrender. As we see how Mary said, the Lord's will be fulfilled. I am his servant. And Joseph moves forward in obedience, um, also knowing that there was there was probably talk their whole life that they had a child that was conceived before marriage, which was not okay. And so he willingly stepped into that shame and, the, and those questions and wonders because he, he experienced God and God's peace and God's um, truth, which is a really beautiful thing when, when God gives that to us. It helps us not care what the rest of the world says. As we connect the dots in Mary, Joseph, and Jesus' stories um, back all the way to the book of Samuel that we read from and the Psalms, and you think about God's fulfillment through his prophets, to his people, to even to us now, where do you find yourself in this story? Do you find yourself lacking peace? Do you find yourself lacking, having fear and anxiety, facing decisions that you feel an absence of peaceful clarity over? You know, as I address um, people from Monticello Covenant Church right now, I realize that you're at a crossroads for what to do as a church, your future as a church. And, and to be honest, there's a lot of churches in situations right now where COVID has really created some significant challenges and they're really wondering, how do we proceed? How do we continue to be church? How do we regather? Um, what does it look like? I know you're also in, in the discernment process as um, your pastor is retired and you are in a situation of really seeking God. Um, I want to encourage you, wherever you're at um, in this journey, and for people that are outside of Monticello Covenant Church as well, to encourage you to follow Jesus, I encourage you to seek discernment how to live out glorifying God and helping as many people know him as possible. Um, one, one thing I read this week that really encouraged me came from this, um, this beautiful devotional book that I have. And and it reminded me of how often we go about our days and and we we act like we we can't see or hear from God because we're so busy and preoccupied. So I'm going to read to you a short passage from Albert Edward Day on discipline and discovery. And I really hope that this um, this meets you where you're at right now um, of thinking about God's presence and his closeness to you and his gift of peace. Albert Day writes, God is not real to most of us because of the condition of our consciousness. He is closer to our minds every moment than our own thoughts. He is nearer to our hearts than our own feelings. He is more intimate with our wills than our most vigorous decisions. If we are not aware of him, it is not because he is not with us. It is in part because our consciousness is so under the sway of other interests that it cannot turn to him with a loving attention which might soon discern him. And I, and I pause there as I was reading this because I thought about how often my own interest in the things I'm preoccupied about um, can, can really be a stopgap of me hearing from God in, in feeling and realizing his presence. Albert writes, did you ever encounter on the street a friend whose physical eyes looked at you without seeing you? You walked right into him before the alien look on his face changed into one of recognition. Then he confessed that he had been so absorbed in thought about some other matters that he had not been aware of you until your intentional collision with him. You were there, yet he did not see you. Though actually in your presence, he was nevertheless as unconscious of you as if you did not exist. There is a persistent failure of the unemancipated consciousness. It can be so preoccupied by lesser realities that it does not sense the presence of the divine reality surrounding and sustaining it. Something has to happen to end that absorption in other affairs so it can turn its attention to God. And so this morning, as I pause there too, I, I want to just ask you to consider what are some things right now that maybe are occupying your thoughts so much that that as 
how he gives the example of somebody, um, two friends walking towards each other on the street and, and being so absorbed in what you're thinking about that you can't see that friend or experience that friend. That is, that is a very good analogy of how we, um, we can be encountering God throughout the day, but we're so preoccupied in what's going on with us that, that he'll collide with us, but we, we don't see it or hear, hear his coming because of our own thoughts and our own um, preoccupation with ourselves. Albert concludes, he says, sometimes events will do it. One encounters God in a crisis that, as we say, bring us, brings one to one's senses. Death, disaster, sickness, the collapse of friendship are like the collision on a street. They shatter the tyranny of an idea of a dream and release consciousness for the awareness of something greater than the idea of the dream, God himself. It would be a very poor sort of life that was aware of people only when it collided with them or was brought up standing by some decisive act of theirs. And it is a tragic life that becomes conscious of God only in those events that shatter its habitual thoughts and dreams and compel it to recognize his presence and activity. What makes life splendid is the constant awareness of God. What transforms the spirit into his likeness is intimate fellowship with him. We are saved from our pettiness and earthliness and selfishness and sin by constant communion with his greatness and love and holiness. So this morning, as, as, we, as we end there, um, I just want to ask you this week to do something. It's called the, the daily office, the prayer of examine. And examine is E-X-A-M-E-N. It's a, a beautiful practice that was um, brought about by um, uh, St. Ignatius, um, St. Ignatian monks. And what they did was they, they, at the end of their day, they did some reflection of where was God present throughout the day? Where did they feel his presence? Where did they see him show up in their lives? Um, a question we have in our family that we've often asked when I get my kids from school um, is, how did you see God at work during the day? Um, also, as you do that, that prayer of noticing and being aware of his peace, when did you notice God give you peace today? When did you notice that he, um, he was present with you in a situation that was devoid of peace or was anxiety provoking? Um, and it's also important to note, too, of how you can practice the presence of God actively when you start noticing that you are in a situation that lacks peace. Um, and many of us are in those situations right now, and it seems like it's a daily thing. But I think that is the beautiful gift that God is giving us to draw us closer to him and experience his peace. Um, and I, I hope that encourages you today as you um, consider your immediate life, your family life, um, community, um, in a church church body as well. Um, Bruce had asked me as we wrap up today to share some events, some um, events coming up and there we want to encourage you to um, use, seek some of the links that was provided for you um, to watch and participate with some other churches online for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Um, so we are not going to be meeting um, through Facebook Live as Monticello Covenant Church on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but Follow the email um, suggestions for worshiping together with some other communities in that way. Um, and I will see you um, in the next week. Um, and also just to keep praying for each other, seeking God's clarity and discernment and peace as you um, make decisions of how you're going to be as a church body and, and your next steps. Um, and I want to close today with a prayer of peace for our world. Psalm 29 11 says, The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Let's pray together. Lord, would you bring your strength and peace to your people? Would your presence be felt by all who seek you in a powerful way in this Advent season? Turn the hearts of mankind towards you. We pray that the lost turn to you and find an unshakable peace that nothing else in this world can offer. Amen. Go in peace today to love and serve the Lord. And we can give thanks to God together for each other today. And I'll see you. Um, I'll see you in a week. Take care.